I want your soul. Way back in 2012, I believe I stopped the apocalypse. I remember staring down at the endless hole in the desert with wonder and awe. It seemed to go on for forever. A lifelong friend of mine named Bear stood by my side. He scanned the ground and found a large, smooth rock. It must have weighed at least 60 pounds. He rolled it over to the edge of the seemingly infinite void and let it drop. I heard the stone clatter against the walls, smashing against one side and releasing a rush of small pebbles and clods of dirt. They soared downwards with the rock, reminding me of the sands in an eternal hourglass. Look, there's stairs, Bear's girlfriend Stephanie said, pointing a freshly painted red nail at the steps. They looked hewn from solid rock and spiraled down into the darkness far below. Stephanie tilted her head slightly to the side, moving locks of dirty blonde hair away from her eyes. Her appearance reminded me of Emma Stone, and though nearly 25, she still looked like a teenager. We stood together in the middle of Death Valley. The sun sizzled overhead, sending out blinding light that reflected off the sands. Rippling mirages rose off the burning hot ground. Dunes surrounded us, looking as dead and lifeless as an alien planet. I looked up at the light blue sky and didn't see a single cloud. It must have been a hundred degrees out. Rivulets of sweat trickled down from my hair and forehead, stinging my eyes. I wiped it away, looking back down the hole. I kept expecting this aberration of a pit to evaporate like some sort of bizarre optical illusion. Yet there it still stood. A large circle about thirty feet across with ancient granite steps, and of course, the steps had no railings. They looked fairly narrow, maybe a couple feet across. Well, I considered that narrow, at least, considering the thousands of feet of empty space I would fall through if I slipped. I thought about how the drop would feel, screaming for minutes and knowing I was about to die, the ground coming up to meet me the air roaring like a tornado in my ears. I shuddered. The mental image seemed far too vivid. I glanced over at my two friends and Bear was casually smoking a cigarette, raising his tattooed hand. I looked at the tattoo, a reptilian, slitted eye surrounded by the golden spiral. He stood much taller than me and, having done physical labor his entire life, he also had a thick covering of muscle. He was a metalhead and urban explorer, and about 90% of his body was covered in tattoos. Stephanie and him made a very unusual pair, she with her straight-edge valley girl looks, and Bear looking like he just climbed out of a mosh pit at a rock and roll show. He flicked the half-smoked butt into the pit, smoothing his long black hair with his hands. I watched the red light of the ember streak across the darkness and disappear into the endless shadows waiting below. Do you think anybody knows about this? I asked. Bear had a sly grin across his scruffy face. His blue eyes flashed with amusement, and he put his arm around Stephanie. Well, I don't know, but if nobody has, maybe we can make some money off of it, he said. Stephanie smiled faintly at that. I've heard of people who discovered caves making money off giving tours. Maybe we can buy this crappy little plot of land out here. Ah, this might be state land, I said. Actually, it might even be federal now that I think about it. I'm not even sure where the borders of the national park end. It's not like anyone would be going around labeling borders out here anyways. I waved my hand lethargically at the dead, sunburnt desert all around us. Absolutely no one lived out here except maybe the secret mutant descendants of the Manson family. Well, regardless, we should go explore it, Stephanie exclaimed. If we're going to claim we discovered some new wonder of the world, we should be able to tell people what's in it at least. Yeah, right, but what if we get lost and starve to death down there? There's no cell service out here. 
No one would even find our bodies. We would just disappear into thin air. I mean, guys, look around. We can't even call anyone to let them know where we are. Well, that's part of the adventure, Stephanie said, laughing. You weren't complaining when you dragged us out to that abandoned mental asylum and took us to the underground tunnels. I'm with Stephanie, Bear said, gesticulating crazily with his hands. I want to go explore. I think it'd be awesome to have a cave system named after us. Besides, we still have flashlights and plenty of food and water in the car. I have lighters and knives, cigarettes and booze. Hell, I've even got my gun on me. It's not like I think we'll need it, unless there's rattlesnakes down there or something we need to shoot. In hindsight, it was amazing just how wrong Bear was. We all had a backpack filled with goods. Since we had been traveling across California and camping, seeing every national park possible, we had plenty of extra supplies. In fact, the only issue became the amount of weight each of us could carry. I had them fill the backpacks with as much food and water as possible, leaving only room for ammunition, jackets, and some extra clothes. You act like we're going to be down there for the next year, Stephanie complained, rolling her eyes as she hefted the heavy backpack around her shoulder with a soft grunt. All right, let's do this. I'm so excited right now. I feel like Bilbo Baggins must have when he walked out his front door with Gandalf, she said. Bear grinned like a madman, lighting up another cigarette. Without a word or a moment of hesitation, he put his backpack on and jumped down to the first step, a drop of about five feet. My stomach did flips just watching him. He apparently had no fear of heights at all. As I looked down on Bear, it struck me how perfect the circular formation of the pit was. It almost looked man-made or somehow unnatural. Nature rarely works in straight lines and perfect circles, after all. Stephanie went next, slowing herself carefully from the edge and hanging down by her arms until her feet were securely on the step. Unlike Bear, who at times I thought might be slightly insane, she did not simply jump onto the stone. I edged closer to the pit, looking down. A sense of vertigo overtook me. The eternal blackness of the void seemed like a dilated pupil, a staring eye. I felt like it watched us from below. But I wasn't going to look like a chicken shit in front of my friends. They were both clearly excited, especially Bear, who started hopping from one foot to another, anxiously looking up at me, waving me on. He reminded me of a puppy excited about going on a walk. They had already started descending and stood a few dozen feet below the first step, and with a thudding heart, I followed Stephanie's example, slowly lowering myself down from the ledge onto the first step. Once secure, I took a look down. The circling stairs almost seemed like a slit-open conch shell, the swirling golden spiral extending into forever. My friends looked so small standing on those unceasing steps, and for a moment, my intuition screamed at me that we needed to leave. But instead, I took a deep breath and started the descent into the bottomless pit. We traveled for hours. I lost track of time. All of our phones stopped working, and even though I had just charged mine, the screen simply went black. Stephanie's watch stopped ticking after a few minutes descending. I didn't know if there was some kind of magnetism in the pit that disabled electronic devices, but regardless, we no longer had any way to tell time. God, how long has it been? Stephanie asked after our fifth break. We sat on the steps our headlamps sending eerie bouncing shadows all around us. A few of the steps nearby had thin, jagged cracks running through the stone, branching out like lightning bolts. I wondered if they would crumble under our feet as we passed. Uh, it feels like at least six or seven hours, Bear said, no longer as excited as he was at the start of this. Part of it was undoubtedly fatigue, which we all felt. I had a creeping suspicion that we had made a colossal mistake by coming down here. Bear still had a sense of determination, though, and he wanted to keep going. How far down do you think we are? She said again, and no one answered. The air felt oppressive and extremely heavy. What do you guys want to do if we don't find anything in the next hour or so? I asked. I mean, are we just going to keep going down forever? We should make a plan to turn around at a certain point. 
Oh man, give me a break, Bear said, rolling his eyes. What the hell do you have to do today? You act like this isn't the coolest thing we've found on this trip. We should keep going down until we find something. Or until we need to turn around because we're running low on water and food or something. This is probably a once in a lifetime opportunity, man. I sighed. My legs ached and my feet screamed at me. I could feel the blisters rising on my toes. We rose and started descending again. It was then that we heard a sound like a lion's roar, echoing up from below. It sounded predatory and animalistic, but magnified to a deafening tone like an exploding hydrogen bomb. And the stairs began to shake. Falling streams of dust and pebbles streamed down all around us. I tried to scream, but I didn't know if I actually was because all I could hear was that demonic roar. I clung to the wall of the pit as the sound started to fade and then rapidly died down to nothing. Within a few seconds it had passed, and I looked at Bear and Stephanie. They looked pale and shaken in the bright LED lights of the headlamp. Jesus Christ, Bear said, his hands trembling as he reached into his pocket for his pack of cigarettes. I thought I was going to die for a few seconds there. He had succinctly expressed all of our thoughts together, I felt. We can't keep going down any further, man. This is insane. What if that was an earthquake? What if there's more aftershocks coming? We need to start heading back up now. I'm not dying down here. Stephanie and Bear nodded at me, agreeing without any argument. Even Bear, who was normally fearless, seemed to have lost all of his enthusiasm for this adventure. But when we turned and shone our headlamps up, I saw the stairs a few hundred feet above us had collapsed during the bone-rattling explosion of sound. About 30 feet of steps had simply vanished, crumbling into the void, and I suddenly felt very much less secure standing there. I wondered how structurally sound the step I stood on really was. My heart felt like it would beat right out of my chest. Well, I guess the only way out is forwards, Stephanie whispered in a frightened voice. Maybe this cave or whatever has branching tunnels that lead us back up. Something this massive has to have more than one way in and one way out. I didn't really agree with her, and this pit was not a natural cave system as far as I could tell. We had no idea if other paths led out or not, and so we kept descending, because we had no other choice. I clung close to the wall in case that ear-splitting cacophony started again. I wondered what had made it. Perhaps the echoes of shifting tectonic plates amplified as they rose up the pit? and just sounded like a predator's thundering cry. I couldn't be sure. Far below, my headlamp ran over an aberration in the smooth golden spiral of the endless steps. I saw a massive archway, at least ten feet tall. Its sides met in a point at the top, forming an upside-down curving V. Baron Stephanie saw it at the same time I did. Their eyes widened in surprise and delight but a sense of fear gripped me when I saw the archway. Its architecture looked alien. And as we got closer, I saw it glistened, like it was obsidian. Gleaming black rainbows ran over its length when our lights touched it. Oh, thank God, Stephanie cried. Bear ran ahead, sprinting down the steps, like a man dying of dehydration, running towards water. Hey, wait up, I called, feeling suddenly very vulnerable. I looked down the stairs. Far below me, I saw a thin crack that ran on the wall of the pit for hundreds of feet. And I caught a glimpse of a face peeking out of it. I couldn't be sure, but it definitely looked like a face. The creature had bone-white skin and pure black eyes. Its features seemed a combination of human and demon. It had an insane rictus grin showing many sharp, long teeth and within a fraction of a second, it disappeared back into the crack, and I wondered whether I had really seen it or not. Perhaps all the darkness had caused me to start hallucinating. I knew that prolonged sensory deprivation could cause hallucinations and potentially bizarre experiences. Having tried sensory deprivation tanks, both sober and after eating magic mushrooms. Stephanie and Bear stood in front of the obsidian arc, peering down a massive stone tunnel. The ceiling towered 30 feet overhead. Sharp stalactites 
hung over our heads like waiting guillotines. Natural formations of glimmering marble and jewels jutted out of the walls of the light brown rock. Bear ran forwards laughing. He stopped at the first cluster of gems he saw. They looked like the petals of a multicolored flower, green, white, red, and blue and black. These are diamonds, Bear said, in awe. This is opal. This looks like jetstone. That's definitely a sapphire, and the one next to it. Holy shit, it's an emerald. He stood up straight, looking back at me, his mouth hanging open. Holy fucking shit, Juan. We're rich. None of us are ever going to have to work again. Well, that's great, Bear, except we still don't know how to get out of here, I reminded him. I kept checking behind us, and I thought I had glimpsed that white, staring face with the black eyes again. But it moved like a ghost. Every time I tried to shine the light where I thought I glimpsed it, there was nothing there. I started to feel like I was losing my mind a little bit. We continued walking as a group for a few minutes, and smaller tunnels branched off to larger ones, periodically. We would hear soft moaning sounds and whispers coming from them as well, and I could never pick out any words, as it came across as more of a low susurration, but it had the cadence and rhythm of speech. That is so creepy, Stephanie whispered after we had passed our fourth branching tunnel. It sounds just like voices and people whimpering, as if there was some medieval torture chamber over there or something. Yeah, it's got to be some natural echo from the earth. I mean, obviously there's nobody else down here. There are sometimes subterranean rivers and waterfalls, so maybe that's what's going on. If one was nearby, its babbling could get distorted in the tunnels and come across as whispering or people talking. But after I said it, I didn't really believe the argument myself, even though I badly wanted to. I mean, after I heard the voices, it sounded like voices, not running water. Oh my God, Bear said. He was out in front, walking ahead of us by at least ten feet, so he ended up seeing the two bodies first. He started running, kneeling down over the girls. Stephanie and I followed a few seconds later. They looked like two high school students, still wearing their backpacks covered in pins about love and peace. The nearer of the two girls was clearly dead. Her entire body had swollen up like a tick after feeding, her skin turning green as rancid gases bubbled under the surface. I couldn't even tell if she once had eyes or a mouth because the flesh had expanded so much. Her bloated body pulled against the fabric of her short-sleeved t-shirt, skirt, and straps of her backpack. The other girl was a somewhat different story. At first, I thought she was dead too. I couldn't see any breathing and she looked extremely pale with a blue tint to her lips. Bear knelt down and tried shaking her, but he got no response. Then he licked the back of his hand and held it in front of her mouth and nose, and after a few seconds, he looked up excitedly. She's breathing. It's very slow and shallow, but she's breathing. I don't know what's wrong with her. And then her eyes started to flutter open and she gasped. Her fingers clenched and she licked her dry lips. Water. Please, water, she moaned. Bear immediately grabbed a bottle from his pack and held it up to her lips. She took small sips, pulling away and breathing hard after each one. But soon she had finished the entire bottle and then two more. The color started to return to her cheeks slightly, though that bluish cast stayed over her fingernails and lips. And she motioned for us to get close then reached into her pocket and pulled out a piece of paper. Um, I'm not going to make it out of here alive. This was given to me by somebody else. It's the only reason we've made it this far, she said. She coughed, rolling on her side and vomiting some of the water. I saw streaks of blood mixed in, dark red like a garnet. Bear looked at the piece of paper, frowning. He stood back up and turned to face us, and then he started reading it out loud. The first rule to survival is this. When you see the angel of death, the woman with the backwards-facing head, you must cut your flesh and give an offering of blood immediately. The second rule is that if you hear the first trumpet blow, you must hide. Anyone who does not leave the main tunnel by the time the second trumpet blows will know undying agony. 
The third rule is that if you see the dark silhouettes coming down the corridors, shadows in the shapes of men and beasts, you must close your eyes and count to 30. They are eaters of souls and will suck your soul out of your eyes if you give them the chance. Yet they will pass if not fed. The fourth rule is that if you encounter anyone with the mark of Cain, you must kill them immediately. You will know the mark of Cain when you see it. It is a most hideous thing. The fifth rule is that if you see the ruler of the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon, you must not look at his face. We all stood in silence for a long moment, and I felt the strong urge to laugh. Then I looked down at the swollen body of the dead girl and immediately changed my mind. The blonde girl yanked her backpack off, gasping and spitting blood constantly. She reached around in the bag, frantically looking for something. With a triumphant smile across her pretty face, she yanked it out and handed it to me. I took the ancient leather-bound Bible. It looked like it had some traces of a white, shining crystal smeared across its cover. I opened it up and saw someone had written in spiky, copperplate handwriting, Property of Smiley. A bookmark hung out on the back of the text, and I opened it up and gasped. The bookmark was actually a tiny, mummified pinky finger. It looked like someone had cut it off a small child's hand, and it smelled woodsy with a hint of pistachio, cinnamon, and sulfur. I've never smelled anything quite like a mummified body part in my life. Oh my God, Stephanie cried, putting her hands above her mouth. Is that a child's finger? The girl didn't answer. She had completely collapsed on her stomach now, and she looked like she was rapidly worsening. Who, who are you? How did you two get here? Why do you have someone's finger in that Bible? The girl shook her head at us. No time for all that, she said. I got a glancing blow of the poison. A very small dose, but it's doing its work nonetheless, and I can feel it writhing like snakes through my blood. She closed her eyes for a long moment, breathing slow. Then she fixed her unsteady, watery eyes on us again. My name is Isabella. I'll tell you that we came here by accident, exploring underground tunnels with the Rainbow family. We got lost, and the tunnel started changing. Her voice cut off, and a shriek echoed from further down the main tunnel. Isabella's eyes then flew wide open, bright spots of red showing on her pale face. She began hyperventilating immediately. They're coming. They're coming back, she cried. Oh, God, help us. I saw a shape far away like a galloping horse. My mind couldn't comprehend what I was seeing for a moment. It looked totally alien, something not from this world. There was a sound like helicopter blades slicing through the air, jarring and rhythmic. As it got closer, I saw a bizarre and monstrous creature. It looked almost like a giant flying scorpion, and it was about the size of a Great Dane. Its legs writhed and skittered like massive alien eyelashes. I saw its stinger dripping clear, lethal venom as if it were salivating through its tail. Its spiky wings looked like those of a dragonfly's, blurring in a sea of motion as they propelled it forward. It was, in reality, the face that affected me most, however. It had a human face, complete with changing expressions. It had no hair on its body, but even without eyebrows, I could see the scowl of bloodlust and fury. The eyes had a filmy look, as if covered in cataracts. The pupils looked faded behind the veil, the irises a muddy gray. Bristling spikes stood out at the top of its head, black, pushed back quills with barbs on the end. Overall, the creature was one of the most instinctually repugnant and frightening creatures I had ever seen. Bear and Stephanie stood there, their mouths opened, just staring. And Isabella tried to crawl away. She had thrown her backpack to the side and started on. No, no, she moaned. Bear, shoot that. Shoot that goddamn thing now. What are you waiting for? And I looked and he looked like a man waking up from a nightmare for a moment, his eyes moving quickly around before focusing on me, and then a smile broke out on his face. 
with the creature only a few steps away. I thought we were all dead, but in a blur, Bear yanked the giant black pistol from its holster, and with a booming echo like a shout from God, he fired at the abomination's eerily human face. The head exploded in a fountain of bone splinters and bright blue blood. Its wings continued to pound the air crazily, and the body continued coming at us for a few more feet. Then it crashed to the ground, sliding its stinger and tail still striking out at the air. I jumped back and saw Bear and Stephanie do the same. It landed on top of Isabella, soaking her in its blood, and she screamed. The stinger continued to drip clear poison from its wicked-looking barb. I saw drops of it sliding off the creature's body and onto Isabella's skin. It burns! It burns! she cried, trying to wipe away the poison. But she was on her stomach, and with the creature pinning her down, she couldn't reach. Like some ancient Chinese water torture, the drops continued to fall, searing and lethal. I need help, guys, Bear said as he tried to lift the heavy creature off Isabella. Stephanie and I went around, giving the stinger and poison a wide berth. I reached under its body, and it felt slimy, cold, and just revolting. It was like the texture of drowned earthworms after a summer rain. As I pushed, I felt the sogginess in its skin. In blue blood, the color of antifreeze soaked my hands. I wanted to pull away. I felt soiled. I wanted to take a long shower and wipe the filth of this creature off me. The body started to lift, and with a grunt, the three of us pushed it off Isabella. I looked down at her and realized it was too late, though. Her eyes rolled back in her head, showing only the whites. Her legs began to kick violently, her fingers spasming as her arms jumped and danced. She began to make a choked, gasping sound. Then her skin started to turn a sickly, cancerous green, and her whole body began to swell before our eyes. She gave a death gasp and stopped kicking, finally falling limp. As we left the corpses behind, still shaken, Bear looked at the Bible Isabella had given us. Juan, why do you think there's a human finger in here? Stephanie asked, still repulsed by it. Is that some sort of occult thing? Maybe even witchcraft? I shrugged. I knew a lot more about history and books than either Bear or Stephanie. They almost never read, and I read constantly. Fingers have been used in occult rituals for thousands of years. In the ancient Buddhist scriptures, a madman and extremely talented warrior used to go around killing random people and taking their fingers for a necklace. They called him Engilimala, or finger necklace. There may be some relation to worship of Kali, the goddess of destruction. He ended up converting to Buddhism, renouncing violence and becoming enlightened, though. In modern rituals, witchcraft still uses severed fingers. Fingers represent dexterity, touch, and manipulation of faraway objects. Cutting off a finger also symbolically represents a cutting of ties in an occult ritual. That's about all I know about it. Well, thank you for that enlightening information, chatbot, Stephanie said jokingly. You remind me of those AI robots where you can ask them any random question and they come up with an answer. Hey, don't shit on me just because I actually do research, I said, smiling. And speaking of research, what page of the Bible is that finger marking? It may be important. Those girls had two things after all. The list of rules and the Bible. Isabella obviously considered them important because those were the only two things she singled out to give us while she was dying. Bear then opened the Bible to the page with a finger, and he looked down, frowning. It's Revelation 9, he said. Then he began reading aloud as we all took a break, passing around water and peanut butter crackers. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, 
as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Bear stopped reading, and his voice reverberating eerily down the stone corridor, bouncing off of priceless gems and hard standstone. So that thing we killed, was that a locust? Stephanie asked. It kind of looked like a scorpion to me. I don't know, I mean, it doesn't really matter at this point. It's neither a scorpion or a locust. It's clearly a different species from either. Perhaps it's lived down here for millions of years, hunting in the dark. But it just makes it all the more important to find a way out of here as soon as possible. There could be thousands of those things down here. Millions, maybe. I mean, really, who knows how big this place is? Sighing, we got up and continued looking for a way out. Ahead, I saw a faded sign. It looked like it was made out of pure silver without a sign of rust anywhere. But the letters had nearly disappeared over the many years it had clearly been there. When we got close, I brought my light right up to it and tried to make it out. After a few seconds, I realized it was a sign for a city. Bloodstone, population 144,000, it read. The faded ancient sign for the town seemed to point down a smaller branching corridor to our left. There were no gems or high caverns on this path. It seemed like some ancient civilization had carved the narrow corridor out of stone itself. A path a few feet wide stretched out in front of us, going totally straight as far as the eye could see. Which way do we go? Bear asked. Stephanie looked excitedly down the path to Bloodstone, population 144,000, at least if I believe the sign. Obviously, we go towards the town, Bear. We don't know where this main tunnel leads. It could just go on forever. If there's a town, there's people, she said. Are you fucking nuts? There's no goddamn town down here. Who would live down here in complete darkness? She shrugged at me. We continued walking for hours down the carved stone trail to Bloodstone. It went straight the entire way until it started to open up. The ceiling and walls expanded until, within a few minutes, we found ourselves in an enormous cavern. There were doors and empty windows carved into the rock. Even the ladders were made from stone. I saw hundreds of these ancient homes stacked one on top of another. A pale face peeked around the corner, its massive black eyes practically bulging out of its head. Hey, wait, I said as the creature turned and ran away. It looked vaguely human in its general body shape, but it was extremely pale, hairless, and with much larger eyes. I wondered if these were some strange offshoot of a human species, lost souls who had gotten caught down here thousands of years ago and evolved to survive in these harsh conditions. It sprinted away, webbed feet slapping hard against the slippery rock trail, sloping upwards through the center of these endless carved out empty houses. Within seconds, I lost it. It sprinted forwards like a greyhound, far faster than any two-legged creature should be able to run. I heard the wet smacking of its giant webbed feet receding into the distance, and I saw its long mutant hands flying back and forth in time, with its stride. Then, a gunshot rang out. I kept running towards where I had seen the creature last, and I saw a man, in a black Kevlar vest and camouflage pants, pointing a smoking AR-15 down at the writhing humanoid's head. 
An exit wound the size of a grapefruit emerged from the back of its chest. It began to spit bright red blood onto its pale skin, its large black eyes rolling in pain and terror. The man pulled the trigger again and the back of the humanoid skull disintegrated, a waterfall of brain matter and dark blood streaming out beneath it. It started to form a spreading puddle on the cold stone. Hey, I cried out. I was shocked. It's a person. He looked up suddenly. I saw he had tanned, almost golden skin and very dark eyes. His face and head looked freshly shaved. His entire demeanor screamed military or perhaps a hired gun, and he pointed the rifle at us next. Put your hands up, he said slowly. He had a strange accent that sounded vaguely Caribbean, but I couldn't place it. We all put our hands up slowly, though I saw Bear's fingers twitch as if he wanted to go for his gun. Where did you all come from? Death Valley. Right, of course. And where did you all enter? He paused, looking at us for a long moment. Ah, don't worry about me. What's your name? He said, and we introduced ourselves. He grunted. You all need to turn around and get the fuck out of here. My agency is currently doing excavations in this area, and we don't need any civilians running around. It's bad enough we have these things crawling everywhere. He pointed to the white mutated corpse bleeding at his feet, emitting a rank smell of shellfish and coppery blood. Is that the mark of Cain? Bear asked. We were told to watch out for something called the mark of Cain. And the man laughed. The mark of Cain looks nothing like this. Those with the mark lose all their skin. It just peels away. Hard bones start to grow over their bodies. They grow black veins throbbing with poison all over the outside of their faces, arms, and chests. And their eyes and mouths turn a rotten, sickly shade of green. You will know the mark of Cain instantly. Their blood is poison, and they are almost impossible to kill. They have regenerative properties from whatever strange chemicals flow through their black blood. The mark of Cain is much uglier than these poor idiots. These creatures are just inbred descendants of some long-lost race. We call them the Fishmen, for obvious reasons. I looked at the webbed feet and hands and the slimy bone-white skin, and I could see why they would have named them that. They even gave off a fishy, salty odor as if the smell of a faint ocean breeze blew through the passageway. Well, what agency do you represent? I asked. The man paused for a long moment, looking like he was thinking hard about the answer, and he opened his mouth. Well, it depends on who, he started to say, and then a resonation began to sound, cutting him off. At first I thought it was an earthquake sending off echoing vibrations through the cavern, but as it grew louder, I could hear the shrieking, harmonizing notes of some massive trumpet. Rocks started to fall all around us, first just small pebbles from cracks in the ceilings and walls, and then larger and larger stones. I saw the soldiers spin away from us and begin running towards one of the houses carved into the stone. I tried calling him, but I couldn't even hear myself scream in the din of the deafening trumpets. With my adrenaline spiking, I motioned for Bear and Stephanie to follow. Without looking back to see if they would, I started sprinting towards the same house the soldier had entered. I did not want to lose the one person who might know what's going on here. The trumpet cut out as suddenly as it had begun. I heard the heavy thudding of many booted feet behind us. I glanced back quickly and saw dozens more soldiers, all armed with AR-15s and bulletproof vests. They screamed something at the soldier I followed, but my ears rang so loud I could see their mouths moving as if from a silent movie. I figured it was something along the lines of, what do we do? But by then the second trumpet blast had sounded, and my ears rang as the soldiers' mouths moved. 
yet it was as if no sound came out. Bear, Stephanie, and I got inside the carved chamber as the second and much shorter trumpet last cut off. The last ringing vibrations disappeared down the endless tunnels, and for a long moment, nothing happened. The soldiers continued to run towards us, screaming and asking for orders. I then heard a hissing sound, as if a gas main had been cut. A suffocating chemical smell began to fill the cavern, and I took a deep breath in and held it. A sense of rising pressure seemed to fill the air. Then, the ground outside the house erupted with fire, like a hydrogen bomb going off. Clear blue flames shot up in the center of the tunnel floor, and I heard a whooshing sound as the inferno spread. Long tongues of flames rose, licking the stone walls. The men stopped in their tracks, their uniforms immediately starting to catch fire, their skin liquefying and falling off in molten drops. Their mouths opened in a silent scream, and I could hear the sizzling of their bodies, like bacon grease spitting out of a hot pan. They danced, jumping from foot to foot, their arms punching at the air. In a matter of seconds, I saw all their clothes disappear into smoking ashes, blowing away from their bodies in the slight wind that blew through the cave. I felt no heat at all, standing on the stone floor of the ancient house, but I smelled the burning hair and searing meat of their melting bodies. Within a few more seconds, only blackened skeletons stood there, the grinning skulls still looking in our direction before they collapsed to the smoking stone floor. The fire disappeared as quickly as it had started, and the boiling blue flame seemed to suck back into the earth itself. Bear and Stephanie looked at our new companion with horror-struck faces. He did not look nearly as perturbed as I would have thought, seeing his entire company wiped out. Instead, he simply shook his head. Ah, Blackwater keeps sending us rookies, he said, giving us half a smile. They gotta learn somehow, right? We learned that the man's name was Agent Garland. He was vague on why he was down there with hired goons. We hadn't talked for more than a minute when we heard a strange wailing coming through the town. Everyone went deathly quiet immediately. Agent Garland's eyes went wide and he started breathing fast as well. I looked out the threshold peering to the right, the direction we had come, and seeing nothing but a smooth stone passageway. Stephanie stood on my other side, and I heard her gasp. I then turned to my left and immediately knew what had scared her. It looked like thousands of black silhouettes, slithering and limping and twisting down the road, coming closer and closer to us. I saw pure ebony shadows in the shape of venomous snakes, dozens of feet long. Others had two legs and two arms like a man, but their limbs looked as thin as sticks and their bodies stood twenty feet high. Their faces were expressionless, like a black ski mask, with no holes for the eyes or mouth. The wailing grew closer, more insistent. It sounded like a mother broken with grief over the death of her children, a kind of hysterical shrieking that only amplified in the massive cavern. It bounced off the ceiling a dozen stories above our heads, echoing and distorting. Stephanie and Bear screamed behind me, and rivers of sweat ran down my face. There was a rule about this, I yelled, barely hearing myself over the wailing. Stephanie and Bear continued to look at me with wide, staring eyes. Agent Garland simply smiled, waiting, and I tried to remember the list of rules. Though this happened years ago, I remember the panic that set in as my mind drew a blank. There was too much stress, too much going on around me. I couldn't focus or even think clearly. I took a deep breath and tried to calm my mind. In an instant, my subconscious started spitting up pieces of the rules. I remembered slowly. The rules discussed not looking at the face of a badden, getting off the main path if the trumpet sounded, something about the angel of death, killing people with the mark of Cain, and it then came to me in a flash. The rules had said something about shadows attacking us through our eyes. Everyone, close your eyes, I screamed as loudly as I could. 
The wailing was right outside the empty stone threshold now. Without looking to see if my friends had heard, I slammed my eyes shut and waited, counting the beats of my thudding heart. The wailing then cut off suddenly. I felt the presence standing directly next to me and I heard a low, guttural moaning. Something cold gently caressed my back and arms before rising to my cheek. Soft footsteps then fell around us, a sound as light as tall grass blowing in a breeze. Hissing and a deep, choked gurgling erupted from something behind me, and I felt more and more cold tendrils and hands pressed against my skin. A sense of rising pressure surrounded my body, and I felt like screaming. I felt my skin crawling. I tried to pull away, but I was surrounded on all sides by the grasping, alien hands. They disappeared all at once with the sound of a massive balloon popping, and I heard bears slowly exhaling behind me, and Agent Garland was laughing. My heart beat a frenzied runaway rhythm that pounded in my ears. Okay, it's been 30 seconds, Bear said, sounding out of breath. You can open your eyes. We decided to rest and have a meal together. The stress of nearly dying twice had done a number on us psychologically. I felt totally drained, and I would have liked to have laid down and rested. We had traveled for many hours, and my feet screamed at me with throbbing blisters and waves of sharp pain. So, what are you going to do now? I asked Agent Garland as I pulled out sardines and crackers. I tore into them ravenously, chugging a couple bottles of Gatorade as I ate. Can you get us out of here? Uh, I'm not really in charge of this mission, he said without meeting my gaze. He shifted uncomfortably from foot to foot. The main group is down far below us. You would have to ask the commander. Well, what are they doing down there? Stephanie asked. Her curiosity piqued. Is there something important for national defense? And Agent Garland smiled at that. There's something important for everything, he said, a cynical gleam reflecting off his face. God lives down there. He's kept locked up by the angels because, well, I shouldn't be the one who has to tell you this, but God has gone totally insane. He gave a large part of his mind to create the universe, and now he's slowly dying down there, like the serpent eating its own tail. We're actually in his body right now, walking through these tunnels of the bottomless pit. Those fires and shadow creatures are like immune cells, and they're trying to kill all trespassers. Only those with a sign of heaven on their foreheads don't get targeted. Well, what's the sign of heaven? I asked, and he waved his hand at that. Nothing you need to worry about because you won't be getting it. Only the angels have the sign. It's like a white pulsing symbol on their foreheads. It kind of looks like a backward seven with a slashing diagonal line through it. I don't know what language it is or what it means. The angels are not exactly conducive to talking that are more likely to kill you on sight. Agent Garland then got up, stretching and sighing. Well, this has been fun, but I have to meet up with the main group and report the casualties. It's not the first time and it won't be the last, but there's always so much goddamn paperwork. I'm sure you understand. He then pointed his index finger at the still smoldering bones, accusingly. I saw only tiny fragments remaining now. The fine gray ashes blew in the light breeze down the tunnel. The cave not only cremates people, I thought with a hint of hysteria. It even spreads their ashes for them, almost like a loving family member. I shuddered at the thought. Agent Garland then started walking away without a backwards glance, and I jumped up. Wait, I said. Baron Stephanie then joined in my chorus of yelling, their hysterical voices rising in a frenzy. You, you can't just leave us here. Do you at least know the way out? The way out, he responded, still walking away, is further in. If you find the center, you'll find the exit. There are many paths in, but only one way out. So it is, and so it has always been. And with that cryptic message, Agent Garland disappeared around the corner, and I wondered if I would ever see him again. After a minute of discussion, we decided to follow in Agent Garland's tracks. We hoped that if he was heading down into the deeper levels, 
the center where he claimed God lived, that we could simply tag along and get the fuck out of this madhouse. And yet, no matter how fast we walked, we couldn't catch a glimpse of him. I don't know if there were secret tunnels somewhere in the thousands of stacked stone houses of bloodstone, but if there were, we had a snowball's chance in hell of just finding one of them randomly. This is bullshit, Bear said gruffly, sweating heavily again. He sulked like an angry child, fingering his holstered gun. We headed deeper into Bloodstone, and it looked like it had once been a marvelous city. It had ancient stone posts where lamps used to burn. In the center of street intersections, beautiful statues of angels loomed over the dead lands. The caverns opened up above us more and more. After it had risen hundreds of feet, our flashlights lost sight of it. The headlamp simply would not pierce into the darkness that deeply. These look like the statues Michelangelo did, Stephanie observed, looking at a heavily muscled angel in a robe, ripping open the jaws of a massive serpent. The angel's stone wings hung out behind it, long projections that dwarfed its body. But it looked different from the statues of angels I had seen. Its wings looked much more reptilian, like the wings a dragon might have. They had bat-like webbing between the pointed bones that ran out into a graceful curve to spikes, and its eyes had a sheen of cruelty and arrogance that came through even in the carving. I pointed this out to Bear and Stephanie. They looked slightly unnerved by the observation. Well, who's to say that the descriptions of angels done by ancient artists have any relevance to reality. They could look reptilian, or could be made of light, or they could be totally extraterrestrial and incomprehensible, Stephanie said. Humans only base observations of life on what they see on Earth, but they can't even comprehend what other forms of life could take. Maybe these angels aren't even from our planet. I thought about what she was saying for a minute, and what she said made a lot of sense. No, no, there's no way evolution would make such a similar creature to a human being, Bear said, speaking for the first time. I jumped slightly. These angels look like people with wings to a large extent. So either people and angels evolved from a common ancestor, or people were made in the image of angels, or I'm saying that these statues might not be what the angels actually look like, Stephanie interrupted. Oh yeah, okay, right. Bear returned to his sullen state. He continued to keep his hand on the holstered pistol, nervously looking right and left. I felt it too. There was definitely a feeling of being watched. We continued to walk through the streets of Bloodstone, and I caught glimpses of what I assumed were what Agent Garland called the Fishmen. White, pale faces with large black eyes. They were extremely fast, and by the time I even glimpsed one out of the corner of my eye, it was gone. But they didn't bother us. They seemed content with just watching us pass by. Maybe they were more afraid of us than we were them. We had entered a different part of the city with graceful towers that extended far up into the darkness when we encountered the first creature with the evil deformity called the Mark of Cain. These remind me of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Stephanie observed as Bear smoked a cigarette trailing behind us. I looked up at the architecture with admiration. The ground floor of the massive stone tower had dozens of archways leading in, almost like a spider's compound eyes looking out on the abandoned city. These ancient people must have been powerful to build all this, I said. Do you think they tunneled it out of... A soft sound then interrupted me, but in the silence, it came out jarring. I heard a choked gurgling laughter. It was a soft sound that quickly faded to nothing, like a man with a slit throat trying to laugh in his final moments. But I could tell from the way Stephanie and Bear froze too that we all heard it. Bear took out his gun and spun to face the threat. A tall, twisted figure slid silently out of one of the shadowy archways of a nearby tower. Its head scraped the top of the threshold, a height of nearly ten feet. As our headlamps illuminated the newcomer, I saw a face straight from the wildest nightmares of a delirium tremens patient. 
The description Agent Garland had given us of the mark of Cain paled in comparison to its true horror. It looked like its face had somehow flipped inside out. It had no skin or eyelids or hair anywhere. The bony, off-white skeletal plates on its forehead joined with raised cracks, running across its scalp like ugly scars. Two eyes shone out with a shade of green that reminded me of putrefying infection in fetid swamps. They glowed with their own inner light. Dark, twisting veins ran like the slash marks across its entire body, throbbing with each beat of its alien heart. They writhed like fat worms, a rapid quivering pulse passing through them every few moments. The creature's strange green eyes glowed brighter with excitement and bloodlust. It had no lips, just sharp bones that met in a line. When its mouth was closed, I couldn't see any sign of it. But as its plated legs sprinted with powerful strides towards us, it opened its mouth in a silent scream. I saw its jaw unhinge like a snake's, falling down to its chest. More sickly green light flooded out, illuminating the entire street with its fetid illumination. As it got within twenty feet of us, I saw that deep cracks ran through the rest of its body, zigzagging in small, tight lines like black stitches. Bear fired his gun, and it rang through the rocky cavern with a blast, like a cannon firing. I saw the first bullet smash into the creature's face, and part of its skeletal face blew apart, the cheek shattering like ceramic. In a frenzy of bullets, Bear pulled the trigger again and again, in the space of a second. The abomination's kneecaps and shin bones were covered in white bony plates, almost reminding me of some ancient gladiator's protective uniform. But the large caliber bullets of the pistol blew the legs off the creature apart in a flash of bone splinters and black blood. The smell of gun smoke then filled the air. I also noticed a subtler but still somewhat foul stench that reminded me of sulfur and campfire smoke. It emanated from the creature's body. With an ear-splitting shriek like a steam whistle exploding, its open green mouth erupted with cyclonic whirls of green light. A piece of the light spun off from the bubbling, frothing mass steaming from its mouth. It looked like some sort of floating cloud of ball lightning about the size of a basketball. It came at us like a cannonball from hell, blurring through the air. Rippling currents of electricity sizzled and popped as it spun, flying straight at Stephanie's head. An overwhelming odor of ozone followed it. Bear then sprinted toward Stephanie, and I saw it happen as if in slow motion. He tackled Stephanie to the cold stone ground, the lightning ball flying over her head and missed her by mere inches. As she fell, her hair flew up, and a flash erupted as the ball of lightning touched a lock of it. That part of her hair erupted into blue flames and disappeared without leaving ashes or smoke. The abomination then dragged itself across the ground like a possum with a snap spine, still emanating its stream whistle shriek. Its eyes and mouth flashed brighter and the black veins pulsed faster. A moment later, another ball of green lightning shot out. The way it rolled off the larger mass of light reminded me of how vendors at the carnival swirled cotton candy around a paper cone. It bristled, shivering with its own trembling energy, and then it flew at me. I stood amazed as it curved through the air, this new death sensation that shone with a cancerous green light. As the ball of lightning soared towards me, I came to life. It soared through the air with the speed of a cannonball and I heard the screams of Baron Stephanie behind me. But it all sounded like an incomprehensible jumble. I jumped to the side, but it was far too late. The glowing ball of energy seared the flesh on my right arm, and I smelled my skin cooking in its own fats. I landed on the ground as a bolt of agony shot right through my body. Bear had reloaded and sprinted towards the broken body of the creature. I raised my head and saw with horror that it had already started to heal. Tiny black veins with worms stuck out of the wounds on the creature's head and legs, restitching the repulsive bony growths that composed its exoskeleton. They jumped and danced as they worked, 
the rounded ends of their tiny leech-like heads performing a miracle before our own very eyes. The dark, fetid blood that gushed from the abomination on the ground had also started to slow significantly. As Bear ran towards it, I saw with horror that it had begun to try to push itself back up on its still-healing, shattered legs, stumbling like a baby deer taking its first steps, but I knew at the rate it was healing that it wasn't going to be long until its wounds were fully mended. As Bear raised his forty-five pistol, ready to try to blow the creature away again, more green light began to form around its mouth and luminescent eyes. While Bear was preparing to fire at it, it had been preparing its own weapons in return. Bear shot it, point-blank in the face, as pieces of the mass of light rippled into a cyclone. The bullet entered through its right eye, like a jack-o'-lantern being smashed. Light poured from its ruined skull, and the back of its head fragmented as bone splinters and pieces of flesh splattered the stone ground underneath it. The green light then disintegrated, it felt like a flashbang had gone off, and I was blinded by the overwhelming light that poured from its destroyed body. I also noticed a strange combination of smells. Ozone mixed with the fetid reek of a slaughterhouse. Bear stood there, panting heavily, his face covered in a thick layer of sweat. He looked down at the abomination on the ground. New veins and tendrils the size of a pencil reached out like fingers through the massive hole in its face. I looked down at my arm, wincing as I saw the deep wound. There was a charred blackened spot about the size of an egg surrounded by patches of angry red tissue that spread out like groping fingers. How do we kill it? I screamed, ignoring the pain. What if it just keeps coming back? What if it just keeps regenerating? I think we should cut off its head, Stephanie said calmly, a steely gleam in her eye. Cut off its head and move it far away from the body? so that way it can't rejoin. She slung her backpack around and came up with a gleaming buck knife, its freshly sharpened blade keen enough to shave with. The creature was still alive somehow. It had gone into some sort of seizure, kicking its thick vampiric legs in violent jerking motions. I noticed it had thirteen fingers and thirteen toes, all crooked and inhumanely long. Sharp black claws grew out of the ends. It shook its head violently from side to side as if it were saying no, spattering its dark blood all over the floor and walls. It shone with oil rain spots, an iridescent pattern of colors gleaming as it streamed from the creature's broken head. Are you sure? Bear asked, hyperventilating. He looked at Stephanie standing there with a buck knife as if he had never seen her before. I must have given a similar look. She had a very sadistic pleasure in her eyes as she nodded grimly. She stood over the abomination's writhing body, each one of her feet planted firmly on a side of its head. Like a boxer, standing victorious over his opponent after a knockout, Bear and I each stood on one of the creature's wrists so it couldn't claw Stephanie out as she completed her grisly task. She knelt down, inhaling deeply, then, without a moment of hesitation, she shoved the blade into the thing's twitching neck. It gave an ear-splitting demonic shriek as it spewed black blood like a fountain. Its jaw unhinged, and the dark blood flowed out of the center of the green electricity, like a waterfall descending from an impenetrable mist. But Stephanie kept going, cutting and slicing, her face a grim mask of determination. I heard a rending sound as its flesh tore. She had a problem with the spine, but at least by that point, all the flesh had been sliced through and its movements had ceased. Its chest still rose and fell erratically, and it gurgled as it choked on its own blood. Here, let me help, Bear said, pushing her aside. With his thick arms, he twisted the creature's head, which now only remained connected to its body by the vertebrae and a thin layer of gore around it. With a sound like a tree branch snapping, the head separated from the body. The green light brightened, faded to nothingness, then came back weakly for a moment before finally disappearing forever. Holy fucking shit. That was intense, I said, feeling like I was about to have a heart attack. Bear held the decapitated head in his hands, an uncertain expression on his face. The nightmare 
seemed to stare up at him accusingly, the empty holes of eye sockets sunken and black in the bony face. What are we going to do with this? Bear asked, shaking the ugly bastard for emphasis. I shrugged. Use it as a soccer ball, I guess. I started to say it jokingly, but my voice cut off as a soft, angelic singing reverberated down the hall. It was singing in some language I had never heard before, a resonant, humming language that nearly brought tears to my eyes with its beauty. As the singing abruptly cut off, a figure came around the curving street. I saw it hovering over the ground, enormous leathery wings spread out on both sides of its body, extending fifteen or twenty feet in each direction. They ended in sharp points like the wings of a bat. Narrow bones ran along the length of the wings, supporting the dark webbing. It wore a black satin robe with the hood pulled back. When I saw it revealed, I gasped. Its head was twisted around 180 degrees. The skin on the neck spiraled around in purple bruises. In the place of hair, it had dozens of black eel creatures with circular white eyes and dripping fangs. They snapped at each other like wolves, fighting over food. I watched in awe as the approaching figure hovered towards us, feeling slightly hypnotized at the creature bobbing up and down like a buoy on a lake. It moved in a smooth, elegant way. I stood there in a daze hoping it would finish its song. I wanted so badly to hear that beautiful voice again. I glanced over at Bear and Stephanie, and they both stared in open-mouthed wonder, Bear still clutching the decapitated head of the abomination under one arm. But that little voice in the back of my head quickly pulled me out of my reverie as I realized that this was the Angel of Death. The Angel of Death glided through the air, its skeletal feet hovering a few inches above the ground. It would fall and rise slightly as it moved. As it got closer to us, the eel-like creatures growing from its scalp started to get more violent, snapping and gnashing their sharp teeth on the empty chair, their jaws clacking together with a sound like a gunshot. Stephanie was actually the first one to break out of the trance. She whispered as if afraid to draw the attention to the angelic abomination. There was a rule about this, she hissed at us under her breath. We need to cut ourselves and give an offering of blood. I jerk like a man waking from a nightmare. The angel of death had closed in on us now, its face still looking away from us. But I knew without a doubt that it sensed our presence, and had likely known we were there for a while. As if to show us how it was done, Stephanie pulled her folding knife from her pocket and slid it across her palm, opening up a narrow slice that instantly began bubbling up with thin rivulets of blood. She held it up, letting it stream down her arm as the angel got within a few steps of us. Bear and I quickly followed suit, flicking open our knives and raising our hands. I felt the quick burning pain as I drew the knife across my palm, holding it up as the eel creature snapped and hissed. Then she stopped, and the strange snake-like beings growing from her head went quiet. For a moment, nothing moved. The silence seemed absolute. What do you seek? She gurgled in a low, slowed-down voice. Why do you foul this holy sight with your mortal bodies? I wondered how she saw us, unless she was able to see and feel through the eels emerging from her scalp. Actually, the more I thought about that, the more likely it seemed. If true, it meant she would be able to see in all directions at once. I imagine no one would ever sneak up on the Angel of Death, as if anyone would ever want to. Uh, we, we came down here by accident, Stephanie stuttered, stepping forwards as she spoke. We need a way out. We are seeking a way out. The Angel went quiet for a long moment. The white cataract eyes on the eel creature seemed to regard us with strange intensity. What is that delicious offering under your arm, son of Adam? she asked. For a second I had no idea what she was talking about. I couldn't tell if she was talking to me or Bear, but the eel's blank white eyes all focused on Bear. 
snapping to attention like dogs begging for a treat. They stopped their gnashing, going very still and looking at him for a long moment. I glanced over and saw he was still holding the decapitated head from the mark of Cain abomination. He hesitated, looking uncertain, and I nodded at him, urging him on. He then held the head high up above his head. It is for you, he said in a diffident voice. We brought it for you, as well as our offerings of blood. The angel of death then spun around, revealing a skeletal face with worms and larvae eating away at the rotting chunks of flesh still stuck to her cheeks and chin. Her eyes glowed, with an inner white illumination like two pale stars spinning in the void. There were no physical eyes in her head, only these strobing and pulsing pits of blinding light. It smells delicious, she admitted, floating forward slowly. Her decaying skull of a head drew within inches of Bear's face. He flinched away, blinking rapidly. I could see him breathing fast as trickles of sweat ran down his face. I could smell the angel of death as she drew near, a smell like old leather and rancid meat. But underneath that, there was a sweet, pleasant odor, like an undertone of lavender. Your offerings are accepted. I will grant you a single boon for this, the angel of death gurgled in a deep voice. She bent her face towards Bear's bleeding hand and stuck her black tongue out. I looked at it with horror, seeing its putrefying sores and necrotic tissue. She used the rotting thing to lick the blood from his palm and wrist. I saw Bear shudder and go pale as her tongue ran over his skin. Then she went to Stephanie, repeating the bizarre ritual. Stephanie didn't show a scrap of emotion during it, however. Then finally, the angel of death came to me. Her tongue felt cold and soggy against my bleeding skin. Small pieces of the decomposing flesh and larvae were left on my wrist and hand as she moved up and down, sucking the blood caressingly almost like a lover. I repressed an urge to vomit, and my stomach did flips. After what felt like an eternity, she pulled away, spinning around and putting her claw-like hands out to bear. Your tribute, she demanded. Reluctantly, he handed her the head. Her arms bent backwards in a way that no human arm could bend, twisting and popping with soft cracking sounds. She threw the decapitated head up to the eel creatures growing from her scalp. They cracked open the bony exoskeleton with a sound like a walnut breaking open. It revealed the spongy pink flesh underneath. It seemed infused with some kind of green growth, almost like tendrils of mold, that ate its way through its brain and muscles. The eels quickly stripped it clean, sticking their pointy snouts in and snapping up the meat with rabbit hunger. Mmm... The angel of death said in a resonant voice that made her sound almost human. It was as if she could taste the meat and blood that the ill creature stripped from the decapitated head, and perhaps she could. After they had finished stripping the meat from the offering, their gnashing and writhing calmed down. She turned her face back to us and I saw, to my horror, that the offerings of blood and meat had revitalized her skeletal face somewhat. A chill ran down my spine. It now had fresh growths of pink skin around her cheeks, mouth, and eyes. I heard Bear and Stephanie gasp in unison as they saw her regenerating face. Your boon, she demanded impatiently, the bones now almost covered with new growths of skin that spread out over the rotten flesh underneath. I looked at Bear. He instantly nodded, and we were all on the same page without having to speak it out loud. We want to know the way out, Bear said, stepping forward and speaking in a loud voice. We want to return home. The angel of death nodded as if expecting this, the eel-like creatures on her head drooping lazily as if they were tired after their meal. The only way out is further in, through the center, she said. But the true king of the bottomless pit will not let you pass without a struggle. His name is Abaddon, and he is a demon of the worst kind. His kind has always been against mine. Since beginningless time, we have fought. For the followers of Abaddon wish to bring about the apocalypse. 
They wish to unleash God from the bottomless pit so that he can destroy his creation before fading into oblivion. They believe that when the universe topples, they will become gods themselves. I believe Abaddon is insane, however. I do not know who promised him godhood unless he promised it to himself. And we must not look at his face, right? I said, smirking. And the angel of death nodded. Mortals must never gaze upon the face of Abaddon. It will melt your flesh off your bones if you do. There are things in the dark that are not meant to be seen by any human eyes. As the angel of death led us farther down into the pit, past more ancient towers and statues of angels with cruel, arrogant faces, I heard something far away. It sounded like people shouting and guns firing. The angel of death floated above the ground in front of us, her backwards face always staring at us, and it gave me the creeps. Her eyes never seemed to blink, and every time I looked up, I always found her staring right at me. After a few minutes of traveling, she pointed to a dark side street with a long skeletal finger. The stone road ran steeply down into the darkness. It looked slick with moisture and I saw a small subterranean stream flowing down the side of it. But as I looked closer, I realized the stream wasn't water at all. The smell of copper and iron in the air was overwhelming as I knelt down, running a finger through it and pulling it up to see the red stain it left. Is this blood? I asked, horrified. The angel of death did not answer me, but only continued to stare at me with her blank, dead eyes. The center is further down, Follow this road until the end. I wish you good luck, but I think I will see some of you again very soon. The last sands are flowing through your hourglass as we speak. So it is with mortals. Weak, pitiful things they are. A mere breath of my power could destroy all three of you in an instant. I couldn't tell who she was looking at when she spoke these words, but they filled my heart with a sense of dread. She drifted away slowly almost lazily, hovering above the ground as she rose and fell in gentle waves, bobbing like a leaf in the wind. Within a few seconds, she had turned back down towards the dead city of Bloodstone. Population, zero. We quickly realized the source of the shouting and gunshots when some agents dressed in gas masks and tactical SWAT uniforms sprinted towards us. They all had automatic rifles as well as dark green M67 fragmentation grenades attached to their belts. They froze when they saw us, but they didn't raise their guns. Their leader walked forwards, hesitantly looking each of us up and down without speaking. Sir, one of the soldiers finally asked in the back after a very long few seconds. Let them go, he said, motioning his troops on. Not my fucking problem. Wait! Stephanie cried as they started to run away without giving us a backwards glance. Are you with Agent Garland? Their leader froze at the name, turning to face her. We met your guy in the city of Bloodstone, Bear said, keeping his hand near his holstered pistol. Look, I don't know who you guys are, but shit is going downhill fast, the leader said, his voice distorted and eerie through the gas mask. We've lost most of our company down there. We are trying to call for reinforcements. I don't know who you are or what you're doing here, but you definitely don't belong here. Going down there is suicide. Well, why are you calling for reinforcements? What's so important that you would want to sacrifice the lives of your men and risk having even more killed? I asked, and his body stiffened. Son, we're trying to stop the apocalypse. He then turned away and motioned for his men to continue following him. Within a minute... They were gone from sight around a bend in the steep, narrow tunnel. More gunshots echoed up from below. Bear and I looked at each other and exchanged worried glances, but Stephanie seemed unfazed. We need to keep going down, she urged. It's the only way out. Yeah, but we don't have any more weapons. We need more weapons, I said regretfully, following her down into the darkness below. After a few more minutes, the tunnel started to open up the river of blood flowing into a swampy mess at the bottom. Strange vines twisted on its surface. Long, blood-red thorns spiraled around their thick stems. 
A bridge made of bones led across the blood-red subterranean lake. I saw arm and leg bones stacked vertically, bound together with narrow strips of silver. Human skulls embedded in the bones formed a pattern, a symbol that seemed familiar. It looked like a backward seven with a diagonal slashing line through it. Across the bone bridge I saw Agent Garland, his face sweaty and pale. He was surrounded by dozens of soldiers, some of them in gas masks and riot gear, others wearing plain black suits. All of them had automatic rifles, and most of them also had hand grenades and pistols as well. Agent Garland, I cried. He jumped, spinning around and pointing his gun at me. When he saw my face, he lowered it. You goddamn idiots, he screamed. You could have just gotten yourself shot. What are you even doing? But his voice was cut off by a terrifying roar from behind him. It sounded as if thousands of demonic voices shrieked together in a cacophony of alien tongues. It was a language of strange hisses, a language of hundreds of disparate voices screaming in low, slowed-down hisses. Another attack! Incoming! A man in a black suit yelled, and the soldiers all turned away from us. Across the bridge, past the group of soldiers, I saw a tunnel that looked like a giant hungry mouth with sharp stalactites and stalagmites sticking up and down like deformed dripping teeth. An abyss of shadows cloaked the passageway, as dark as a midnight funeral. From the darkness, I saw silhouettes of creatures emerging that would have been at home in Dante's Inferno. There were more of the flying locust creatures we had encountered earlier, the ones with hairless, childlike faces and dripping stingers. Their wings beat like helicopter blades, slicing through the air in a deafening boom. Their strange white eyes seemed to change into expressions of pleasure and hunger as they drew nearer. Their stingers dripping poison faster and faster as they got closer to their prey. Dozens of them streamed forwards, grouped in packs of three and four, flying in tight formation. Behind these scorpion-like abominations, I saw something huge crawl out of the darkness. Its skin the color of a black scab. The first thing I thought of when I saw it was of rat kings, when dozens or hundreds of rats get their tails intertwined and become, in effect, one body with countless skittering legs. This was a conglomeration of many burnt, blackened bodies melded together with dozens of arms and dozens of legs sticking out of it. Multiple heads on top moaned in agony, their open toothless mouths drooling blood and black fluid onto the burnt mass of skin below. Their lidless eyes had faded blue irises surrounded by bloody sclera. They constantly cried, crimson tears. These demonic conglomerations towered over the soldiers, each one fifteen or twenty feet tall. Their dozens of legs twisted, in peristaltic waves, resembling the movement of some giant millipede. It propelled the entire mass forwards at a superhuman speed, I saw it scuttling towards us in a blur, and even though this happened years ago, I still see those abominations in my nightmares, and I regularly wake up screaming. The agents opened fire, Bear pulled out his gun, and Stephanie and I took our knives. My burned right arm shrieked in agony as I reached into my pocket for it. I didn't know it at the time, but that would be the last time the three of us would stand together in this life. As the abomination skittered close to us, I saw Stephanie grab a black key she kept hanging around her neck on a silver chain. The pendant looked ancient like some sort of key to a medieval dungeon, but it had no sign of rust anywhere on it. It shone like jet stone, glossy and smooth. She let it drop back under her shirt where it disappeared. It looked like it had some strange occult symbol on it, almost like a seven. For a moment... I wondered if Stephanie was into witchcraft. The flying scorpions descended on the soldiers like dive bombers. They had dark, spiky tendrils flowing back from their heads with wicked barbs at the end. Their faces looked like those of hairless, mutated children. Their eyes looked faded, the pupil hiding underneath the milky film like some leviathan swimming under the ocean. Agent Garland sprinted towards a machine set up on a folding table nearby in the middle of other military hardware. It looked like some sleek, futuristic sewing machine with handheld speaker sets connected to it by wires. 
he frantically started screaming into one of the speakers. We need backup, immediately, Agent Garland shrieked over the sound of gunfire. I saw three of the scorpions swoop down on a soldier in camouflage pants and a Kevlar vest. The soldier raised his gun, blowing the face apart on the nearest abomination. Sapphire blood streamed from the destroyed mass of tissue that was its head. Clear venom continued to stream from its stinger as it crashed to the floor, rolling on its back and twitching like a dying hornet, its tail still whipping crazily in all directions. But the other two scorpions dodged the bullets, their dragonfly wings beating the air hard. They fell straight down on top of the soldier. One wrapped its tail around him while the other used its stinger to inject venom straight into his back. The man twisted, his mouth an O of terror and agony. He dropped his gun, his eyes fluttering, and within a fraction of a second, his body began to swell and change colors. As they flew back down the tunnel they had come from with their new meal, the soldier used the last of his energy to reach down into his belt. He grabbed an M67 fragmentation grenade and pulled the pin. I also saw he had more on his belt that would undoubtedly detonate during the explosion. The scorpions were only about 50 feet away with soldiers scattered all over the massive cavern, firing and screaming and dying together. Everyone down, I shrieked, backpedaling away from the struggle. Grenade! Agent Garland looked up suddenly as the cave erupted into a fireball. A roaring filled my ears. I felt fire lick my skin and smelled burning hair. People started screaming all around me shards of rock and dust starting to fall all around us. I felt one smash into my head. Stunned, I reached up and touched my forehead, pulling my fingers back and seeing them covered in crimson streaks. I looked back the way we had come. More scorpion creatures flew towards us, and I grabbed Stephanie's hand and shouted over the noise of gunfire and screaming. We need to run forward. Where's Bear? And she looked around frantically. I saw Bear running over to Agent Garland, pulling him up to his feet as one of the burnt conglomerations skittered towards them. Bear spun, raising his forty-five and firing. One of the creature's heads exploded in a shower of blackened skin and bone splinters. The rocks in the cave gave a tortured groan as the cave started collapsing around us faster and faster. The cave had filled up with thick, choking smoke. The smell of blood, death, and gun smoke hung heavy all around us. Bear, I shouted, pulling Stephanie forward. He looked up, his eyes wild. Come on, time to go. I motioned forward with my head. The way was still blocked by more conglomerations and flying scorpion creatures. The soldiers kept firing, mowing down those in front. The scorpions then landed hard, on the stone ground, sliding as their legs kicked and their stingers twisted and smashed against the walls and floor. The conglomerations reached us in a sickening wave of limbs and mutilated flesh. They ran forward like tanks, crushing the dying soldiers and scorpion creatures under their heavy, stomping feet. Their sightless eyes continued to roll, their mouths drooling and moaning like coma patients as their long, twisting arms reached out, grabbing any people they could find and snapping their necks. They threw the twitching bodies onto the floor like pieces of garbage. Agent Garland stood next to the mass of now-destroyed military hardware, looking stunned. Bear grabbed his arm and pulled him up. We tried to skitter around the conglomerations, and I saw that, beyond this wave, the way forward looked clear. With the cries of the dying, and agonized soldiers following us, we left that cavern of horrors. I looked back and saw no one living. Now, only the conglomeration stood, nightmarish masses of flesh, victors over the broken corpses of the living. We had nearly reached the center of the bottomless pit by this point. Far off in the distance, I saw light streaming through the tunnels like a second sun. For a moment, my eyes hurt. I heard more cries, more fighting and shouting, but this time the voices didn't seem human. The cavern then opened up in front of us. I saw clouds of silver floating hundreds of feet above our heads. Diamonds and opals embedded into the walls sparkled and shimmered as our lights ran over them. Agent Garland started to come out of his stupor after an hour or so of walking, and the cave seemed to play strange tricks and sounds. 
I thought I would hear fighting nearby, demonic shrieking in thousands of tongues and angelic humming, but I would only find more empty space. We're almost at the end, Bear said, walking next to Agent Garland. Why don't you tell us what's really happening? I know you haven't been totally truthful with us. How are you guys involved in stopping the apocalypse? What's really going on? There are many gods in many universes, Agent Garland began introspectively. In fact, a likely infinite number of both. We've found ways to see into the other universes with some unique technology. Each universe has its own creator god. In some of them, the gods are well and healthy, and people live forever, feeding on bliss and light and music and towers of gold and silver. In these heaven worlds, tides roll over purple-streaked majestic mountains, and the sky itself sings with joy. Cancer, aging, addiction, and many other evils do not exist there. The beings do not have a concept of aging. Like the angels here, they came into consciousness fully formed at the Alpha Point. And until the Omega comes, they will physically remain the same age. But sadly, in our universe, the Creator God could not deal with the stress of exploding all things into existence. It shattered his mind. That's why our world has so much suffering and death, so much war and oppression. It always has and always will, because the foundation itself is rotten. There are also universes that are far worse than ours, where their creator gods became even more sick and evil at the moment of their big bangs. The trauma of those shattered minds rippled across space-time and created hell worlds, worlds where beings exist in incomprehensible agony and torture. There, beings get burned alive, sliced into pieces, dunked into boiling lead or have molten steel poured down their throats. Yet every time they die, their bodies miraculously heal. They come back to life to start the torment again. In universes like ours where God wants to destroy himself, he comes into being surrounded by angels. The angels may be part of his own mind, the will to live. They try to keep whatever essential pieces are still alive in prison forever, so that the universe will not end. And likewise, there are demons. These may also be part of God's mind. They come into existence at the beginning with him. They are, I believe, his death drive, his desire for annihilation. There are occult sites located across the earth. Believe it or not, some people worship Abaddon and his demons. They want to start the apocalypse. They believe that when the universe ends, they will become powerful, godlike beings in Abaddon's new world. These cultists find extremely powerful objects and come here to bring them to Abaddon. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Revelation, but we have one right here, Bear said excitedly, enthralled with this conversation. Stephanie had a stony look on her face as Bear went into her backpack and retrieved the Bible. He gave it to Agent Garland. He opened it back up to Revelation 9 and read aloud. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. We had all stopped around him listening. My eyes widened as he read the words. Something flashed like lightning in my mind. I looked over at Stephanie. She grinned, a psychopathic reptilian grin that made my heart turn to ice and a memory came to me then. Stephanie had been the one who had wanted us to go to Death Valley in the first place. She was the one who had subtly guided us towards the bottomless pit. So the key, Agent Garland continued saying, oblivious to the danger, was a black artifact that came to Earth in an asteroid. Somehow the cult members recovered it after spending millions of dollars and countless years searching. Our agency got a tip-off that a cult member was trying to get the key to Abaddon so that he could unlock the divine chains. Stephanie, I hissed. Everyone looked at me, Stephanie with amusement and bloodlust, Bear and Agent Garland in confusion. She has the key. She is the cult member. 
She must have led us here on purpose. Bear spun, starting to raise his gun, but Stephanie had already seen it and stepped forward. With a lunatic cry, she stabbed Bear in the neck. His gun went off, the shot smashing through the silver clouds high above us as he fell back, dying. He choked on his own blood as Agent Garland went for the pistol holstered on his camouflage pants. There was a demonic roar directly behind us, and we both twisted our heads seeing the body of something red, massive, and hellish. It towered high above us, forty or fifty feet tall. It had thick legs like a tree trunk. Its feet looked like those of some enormous rhinoceros. Looking up at its stomach, I saw the crimson flesh ragged and only connecting in strips. Behind it, I saw a pulsing dark mass of black blood and organs. I am a badden, the creature roared in a voice like a cannon firing. My body froze as ice water ran through my veins, and Agent Garland's mouth hung open. He looked from Stephanie to Abaddon. Stephanie kept her eyes lowered. No one was looking at his face. Stephanie bowed in front of the nightmarish figure standing there, and two dark reptilian wings stretched out from behind his back. I caught a brief glimpse of some monstrous crown on his head, three sharp silver spikes rising dozens of feet above him. Abaddon, she said, kneeling. I come as your faithful servant. I have brought... Then Agent Garland jumped forward, putting the gun to Stephanie's head. Just as he was about to fire, a long, twisted hand came down and crushed him. His body exploded in a shower of gore and spattering blood, and it soaked my face and chest. I felt the silent scream welling up in my throat, but the adrenaline coursing through my body sent me into action. I ran forward, jerking Stephanie's head up so that she was looking straight at Abaddon's face. I used my other hand to keep her eyelid bright open. She began to shriek, her body growing hot under my skin. It felt like she was burning alive from the inside. Her face then began to drip and melt like candle wax, the flesh falling off in strips. Her scream grew deep and harsh, and slowly it started to fade. I looked down, seeing a skeleton in my hands, a skeleton with clothes on and a sacred key. I grabbed the key. I saw it had a sharp dagger-like point at the end of it. Abaddon started to shriek with fury, his demonic voice shaking the stones. From further down in the tunnel, dozens of angels streamed forward, their deafening battle cries reverberating around the cavern. And in front of them, I saw the angel of death, her face towards me as she smiled. Abaddon looked at the large army approaching and fled down the cavern his heavy footsteps shaking the floor. The angels followed, some of them flying forwards and stabbing him in the back and legs. Within minutes, I found myself alone with the corpses of my friends, and I started walking forward toward the tower of light in front of me. The angel of death had told me how to get out, after all. The only way out is further in. I recalled her words. With the key securely placed around my neck, I crossed a bridge made of fine threads of silver and gold. All around the bridge, a blinding illuminance rained down on me. Behind it, I saw trillions of eyes flickering around madly. They surrounded me on all sides, radiating light, their pupils dilated and wild. From everywhere and nowhere, a voice began to speak, shaking me to the core. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I am the fountain of life. God's voice rang out like thunder. It wasn't a human voice, but instead had a strange metallic ringing behind it. It soared and echoed around me with a sound like rushing water. I stood silent, staring into the foundation of existence itself. I saw human eyes, bird eyes, goat eyes, snake eyes, and many others not of this world. Some eyes just radiated light glowing like headlights in the abyss. Why have you come before us? The voice boomed with a sound like a nuclear bomb detonating. I got tricked into coming down here by a follower of Abaddon, an evil person who wanted to start the apocalypse, I said. The trillion eyes regarded me coldly. I would just like to return home. Abaddon is indeed great. 
I was once like Abaddon myself in my last life. I schemed and killed and manipulated until I released the first one with a trillion eyes to destroy the universe. It did, and when existence toppled, I was pulled into the pit. I spent endless years alone, slowly going insane. Finally, I decided to form some of my eternal soul into all things and create this universe. I made the same mistakes as the one with the trillion eyes before me, and now the cleansing must come. When the cleansing is over, all beings will join me in an eternal, dreamless sleep. Well, you deserve to be imprisoned, I spat at the infinite thing. Its eyes seemed to flash faster, rotating all around me like endless stars. You don't even try to make the universe a better place. You just want to end everything so that you can wash your hands of it. You do not see. You are not worthy to be in my presence. You are a bug, a sickly dying thing, a mistake that came from our very essence. All of your kind are worthless bugs. From us you have come, and to us you will return. I stared up into the infinite spirals of lidless staring eyes. They undulated and twisted. Why did you create the universe then if you hate us so much? Why create the earth at all? The voice that came from nowhere and everywhere went silent for a moment. After spending eternity alone in the darkness, I fell into a dream. The dream took everything strong in me, and now I am a shell. I will be the last to die, but once all creatures here have died, I can slip into the formless. For my consciousness is in you, and I cannot sleep until the time of the cleansing has ended. I reached the end of the bridge of gold and silver. The blinding sun stood overhead. I looked around, finding myself back in Death Valley. I stood next to the car, but the pit was gone. I reached into my pocket for the keys, feeling the weight of the pendant against my chest. I decided to drive to the Pacific Ocean, thinking of Bear and Stephanie the whole way. In the end, I threw the black key deep in the water. I stopped the apocalypse, and I hope that no one will ever find it ever again.